So hello and welcome to Wednesday's Weekly, your weekly bite-sized briefing webinar, a collaboration between Action Together, the voluntary community and faith sector and the public sector. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this episode of our domestic abuse series. Action Together are working with Oldham Council to welcome you every Wednesday for the next four weeks to hear from Kate and Idva with Oldham Council to support people experiencing domestic abuse. Without further ado, I'm really pleased to hand over to you, hand you over to Kate, who will be taking us from here. Over to you, Kate. Oh, thank you very much. And welcome everybody to today's session on the IDBA role and types of domestic abuse. So just a quick introduction to myself and the team. So my name is Kate Clark. I'm one of the IDBAs on the team, otherwise known as Independent D D Domestic Violence Advisor. Getting a bit tongue-tied there. Um, and I'm one of about 14 members of staff at the moment. And to put it into context, when I first joined the team about six years ago now, I was only the third IDBA to actually be put into the role. Um, now we've got a whole host of new members of staff, um, really, really expanding, much, much needed roles. Um, so we've got three engagement workers currently who are our front of house, very much part and parcel of our team. We couldn't operate without them. Um, they tend to answer the phones, triage, make the initial calls and just generally support with the day to day running of the service. Then we have six IDBAs who are doing the direct work with victims, survivors of domestic abuse. Um, and then three senior IDVAs, one of one of which is myself. Um, and also within that trio of seniors, we do have the lovely Rehenna, who is domestic violence specialist in um, forced marriage and honour-based violence. And then we have Juliana Lee, our operational manager. And last but not least, we've got Nicola Field, who was previously an IDVA and has now got a really new and exciting role, which is the CHIDVA. And for those of you who haven't heard of the Chidva role, it's very, very similar to the Idva role, except it's working directly with children and young people who have been affected by domestic abuse in their households. I'll just move on to the next slide when it lets me do that. Ah, there we go. So the aims of the session are to understand the role of the IDVA, to look at the different types of abuse and to understand the definition of domestic abuse. So I always like to start with some key facts. So firstly, there were about 2.3 million victims of domestic abuse a year working on 16 plus, um, two thirds of whom are women. Now, that's not to say that men aren't affected by domestic abuse. We do have an increase of men coming through our own service. Um, there is still, unfortunately, a lot of stigma attached to men coming forward who are victims of domestic abuse. But we are working on changing that and getting the support to men that they desperately need. Um, more than one in 10 of all offences recorded by police are domestic abuse related. So it's still a massive, massive um, presence in the United Kingdom at the moment. So what is an independent domestic violence advisor or IDVA, as we like to refer to them as? Um, so IDVAs provide one to one work with high risk victims and survivors of domestic violence on a short, medium basis. Um, so because we're managing risk and we're responding to risk on a daily basis, we're not the type of service really who tends to have cases open for months on end. I would say the maximum we would probably work with a client is about six months, although it can be longer. Um, the advice and support is tailored around the needs of the client and works to reduce risk and ensure safeguarding. Now, when we talk about working with high risk victims of domestic abuse, what we mean by high risk is those clients at serious risk of significant harm or death. Um, so we're working with people who are at really serious risk in terms of domestic abuse. We did previously work with the low and medium um, victims of domestic abuse. However, since COVID has hit and our numbers have gone up massively in terms of referrals, we've really, really struggled um, to keep on top of some of the cases that are coming through. 
We hope now that our engagement team are going to be offering um, that one-to-one -one support in the near future to the low and medium um, referrals that are coming through. So hopefully that will be embedded quite soon. But anyone needing advice and support, whether they're high risk or not, can always contact our duty line. And I will give that number at the end of this presentation. Our duty operates Monday to Friday, nine till four. And whether we're able to provide an advert or not, we can still give that bespoke one to one advice and guidance over the telephone for absolutely anyone who needs it. So advers normally work with the clients from the point of crisis to assess the level of risk. So that might be there's been a recent police call out um, or somebody who might have been living with domestic abuse for a long period of time may phone us and say, today's the day I'm going to leave that relationship. So we're responding to that immediate risk. So moving on with the role of the ADVA, one of the things, well, the main thing we do is to assess the Dash RIC and I don't know how many people have heard of the Dash RIC previously. It stands for Domestic Abuse, Stalking and Honour Based Violence. And in essence, it's just an assessment form and it has 24 questions on. Yes or no tick boxes and a section for comments. So each question is tailored to what that person is experiencing currently in terms of domestic abuse. Um, so we look at that to ascertain if that person is deemed to be high risk or lower risk. So we also support to access safe and emergency accommodation. It might be if a person is wanting to leave a volatile relationship, um, they want access to things like refuges. Refuge spaces aren't necessarily the right fit for everybody. Um, and to that end, we also work with Oldham Council, First Choice Homes to ensure that everybody has access to some sort of safe accommodation. Now that might be B&Bs in the first instance before people can be moved on to temp further temporary accommodation and then moved on again to more permanent accommodation. Now as IDFAs, what we will never ever do is say to a person, you, you're not safe here, you need to leave this address. It's always up to the individual where they feel best place to be. Some people, despite there being a risk, want to remain in the family home um, and that's the right choice for them. So we offer something called target hardening where we look at securing the property that little bit more. And that's again done by first choice properties. So we look at has that person got bolts on the door? Do they need them? Do they need extra window alarms? Do they need a security light? Uh, we also provide things like internal cameras, ring doorbells, which provide the extra security, especially with the recording devices. And if people are accessing that property, such as the perpetrator that shouldn't be, then we've also got that additional evidence in, in terms of the recordings as well. So we support through the civil and criminal justice systems, the criminal referring to when, when a police call out has been made, the individual has decided they want to make a statement and go ahead with the prosecution and then they go on to try and get the case to court. So as it was what we will do is we will liaise with police, we will liaise with the Crown Prosecution Service if we need to submit any additional information to them, to witness care um, and then with, going back to liaising with the police, we also look at trying to get special measures in place for clients so if they do need to attend court as witnesses, we can look at can they attend by video link? Can we put a screen up so they can't see the perpetrator? Um, can they go through a different entrance so they're not bumping into that person on arrival to court? Lots of things just to make the general experience of court that little bit easier for the individual. Um, looking at the civil side of things, we can support to get orders in place. I don't know how many people have heard of the non-molestation order. If not, that works a little bit like um, a restraining order in that it's a legal document that's put in place to prevent the perpetrator doing things like turning up to the family home and contacting that person by phone, um, social media, text, whatever means they may have tried to do previously. Um, it can also include any children to stop the perpetrator going to that child's school 
and lots and lots of different things um, depending on the person's circumstances and we can support to get that in place as well. Now when we come to the end of our support you may find that people are still left with debts, they might need to access benefits, there might be lots of things they're struggling with as a result of the abuse. So we would then sign post to early help and other voluntary services in order to get that person the support they require. So under the Domestic Abuse Act 2021, the definition of domestic abuse is the behaviour of one person towards the other. And A and B, so that's one person and another, have to be age 16 or over. They have to be personally connected, which I'll we'll speak about in a moment, and the behaviour should be abusive in, in order for it to qualify as domestic abuse. So what do we need, mean by a personal connection? Well, personally connected means that they are or have been married to each other, been in a civil partnership, agreed to marry one another, entered into a civil partnership, been in any sort of intimate personal relationship, whether it's a parent-child relationship or basically anyone in the family that you're related to. So it might not be intimate, just intimate partners, it might be mother, daughter, mother, son, father, son. It could even be brother and sister. Um, the only time we wouldn't necessarily get involved is if it was something along the lines of a neighbour dispute. So domestic abuse takes many forms, as we know. Um, physical abuse is the one that most people recognise, but it also encompasses lots and lots of different types of abuse. So we're looking at things like psychological abuse, financial abuse, coercive and controlling behaviour, stalking and harassment, and not forgetting on a base violence and digital abuse. The perpetrators of domestic abuse now routinely use technology and social media platforms to try and take that further control over their victims. Um, it's it's a quite an easy way for people to continue and harass and frighten victims once they've left the relationship. So I'm just going over again what we've mentioned. Behaviour is abusive if it consists of any of the following, which we've just talked about. So if the abuse that is happening to a person consists of any of the things I've just mentioned, it is domestic abuse and it can be supported via our service. So just to go into a little bit more detail on coercive and controlling behaviour, um, I like to mention this one because it hasn't been a crime that long in this country. It's only in the last few years that it's been recognised as a crime in its own right. Um, and under the Domestic Abuse Act 2021, it's now been recognised post-separation. So when a person has left a relationship and they're still being controlled and intimidated and threatened, um, and that person is using lots of different acts to try and maintain that control over the person, it is a criminal offence, whether you're in the relationship or you've left the relationship. So it is a continuing act or a pattern of acts um, that aims really to threaten, humiliate and intimidate the other person. And it's used to harm, punish or frighten the victim. There might not be any physical violence, but that person may be in fear of violence if they don't do what the perpetrator is asking them to do. So controlling and coercive behaviour does not relate to a single incident. It's a purposeful pattern of behaviour which takes place over a period of time and it's used by the perpetrator to exert power, control or coercion over another. Some examples of coercive behaviour might be controlling of the finances, repeatedly putting someone down, telling them they're worthless. And if you're hearing that every day, then generally most people would start to believe that. Um, depriving people of basic needs such as food, I mean, I've recently worked with a lady who did have her own bank account and there was a joint bank account. However, she didn't have any access to that. Her husband did as the perpetrator. He had a bank card, he had a PIN number and what he was doing was just giving her £20 probably every month or so just to buy bits of things she needed. And he was adamant that he needed to see the receipt for every single thing that was purchased. So that was very much controlling the finances and she had very, very little say in what she was able to buy to meet her basic needs. 
Monitoring via communication tools or spyware, you'll be amazed how many people have found bits of spyware in the properties, um, hidden cameras, spyware on phones, which lets the perpetrator monitor emails, um, WhatsApp, text messages that are, that are coming through the victim's phones to try and exert that power and control again, um, and then to make comment on who that person is talking to. Monitoring time, isolating people from friends and family, depriving access to support services such as medical services. Um, and if that person is allowed to access medical services, odds are the perpetrator will often be present at, that, at those appointments. Um, we've seen that before where the individual is not allowed to, to leave the house or go to any sort of appointment on their own. And it's very, very hard to see that that person by themselves to get that bit more information. But we do have ways and means and we will find a way if that person needs support. Um, and reasonable and non-negotiable demands, public or private shaming and sabotaging someone's ability to work. Now I'm not going to show this video at the moment because I am going to circulate this presentation. It's just a really good short clip about five minutes long. It's provided by the BBC and it shows you a little clip on coercive control and what the BBC did was they put a panel of people together they showed them the clip and then they had a little bit of a discussion on whether they felt this was coercive control or not um, for me it's very much so so if you look at that that gives you an indication of what someone might be experiencing when they are going through a co coercive controlling relationship so I'll put that in the um, the, pre the email that's going to be sent out to you just to watch at your own leisure. So just to mention children as victims of domestic abuse as well. So under the Domestic Violence Act, children are now, whether they've been subject to domestic abuse or witnesses to domestic abuse, the voice of the child is extremely important, especially when going through court. Um, and I suppose it's difficult in our service because we work with 16 plus. However, because the minors and they're under 18, they're still very much children. Um, and when you get to those teenage years, it is especially difficult because you're just at the age where you're exploring new relationships. Um, quite a difficult and confusing time for individuals. So we do, do support from 16 plus. However, if there are children present in a relationship where there is domestic abuse, then it's always important to have that chat with children's social care just to get some advice and support. And it may be that there needed to be a presence in that family home as well, just to give that victim some extra support with what's going on. So a child is classed as a victim of domestic abuse if they see, hear or experience the effects of the abuse and they're obviously related in some way to the victim and the perpetrator. So determining the impact of domestic abuse on children and young people. So if that child or young person hears the abuse from another room, if they see someone they care about being injured or distressed, they might find damage to the home environment. Um, it might be that there's broken furniture um, as a result of a scuffle, um, being hurt. I mean, often children, when they see parents fighting, they will try and intervene. They might get in the way and be injured as a result of that. And generally just not getting the care and support they need from the parents or carers as a result of the abuse. Now, one of my, thing, one of my biggest bugbears is, you know, if you see a person in that situation that's experienced domestic abuse, there may be children present. Many people will say, why don't they just leave that relationship? Well, they don't leave that relationship because it's such a daunting and scary thing to do. If you imagine yourself being in the middle of that situation, you might have someone on one side saying, you know what, you just need to leave. You need to get out and you need to leave. So imagine now walking out your front door with key in hand, only the clothes on your back and someone telling you you're never allowed to come back to this property again. It's a very, very scary thought. And when you imagine when people get in these relationships, you know, the domestic abuse isn't always present at the start. They may be very pleasant, polite and loving characters. 
Um, so I suppose that person is might be thinking, you know, especially if they've been told they're worthless, they're no good, no one else will have you. They might start to believe that no one else will have them, but they might also start to think, well, maybe if I just do better, this person will be the person they were when we first entered this relationship. There might be financial abuse. There might be threats to family members. I'll hurt you or your family if you leave. Sometimes there's threats to suicide. I'll kill myself. I can't, you know, I can't not be with you. Lots and lots of reasons. Um, and sometimes also people have family pets that are part of the family, that they're terrified what will happen to this animal if I leave this house. Lots and lots of reasons. But looking into some more specifics, ethnicity, um, those from black and minority groups may experience additional barriers to receiving help or reporting abuse, could be distrust of police, concerns about racism, um, especially in certain communities where there's a fear of rejection from the wider community. Um, and language barriers as well. But just to say that's not an issue. If we've got someone whose English isn't the first language, then we can use interpreters to get to the bottom of what's going on for them. As I mentioned previously, fear of losing children. A victim may be fearful of their children being taken away if they make a report and the perpetrator may have tried to convince them that this is the case. Impairments. We do see lots and lots of people with various impairments, whether that be physical disability, mental health, learning dif disabilities and long term health conditions. Um, we do often get the support of adult social care to help us come up with a bit of a plan of action. But it's not a barrier for us for helping that person leave a, a difficult relationship. Also, just to mention, if people are in same sex relationships, so if we look at the LGBT community, we do now have specialist LGBT IDFAs. So the referrals come into ourselves as normal. And then what we will do, we will make sure they're signposted to the right IDFA team who will pick up the cases and support as necessary. So just to mention Marek, although I will be mentioning in this um, in training that's to come, Marek stands for the Multi-Agency Risk Assessment Conference. So when I talk about individuals coming into us that are deemed to be high risk, every person that is high risk on our caseload will be heard at the Marrick conference. So this is held fortnightly and it's chaired by the police. So what we do is we sit around the table, we discuss that person. There's other professionals present that will always be an id for present. There might be social care, adults and children probation, um, housing, health. So anyone who's involved with that individual will talk about what they already know, um, what some of the risks might be, and then we will come up with a plan of action. Now, as IDBAs, we attend every merit meeting, we give updates, and our most important role is to advocate for that person. So if an individual feels like something's, you know, they've not heard from the police, for example, for the last fortnight, they're not being kept in the loop, then we will be the voice for that person to stress that things aren't going as well as they could be and we need to work together to make that a little bit better and easier for that individual. So just some definitions of risk. So as I mentioned, high risk is a person who is at risk of serious harm or murder. A risk that is life threatening and or traumatic. Um, and from which recovery, whether physical or psychological, could be expected to be very, very difficult or impossible for that person. As we move to the lower mediums, we don't expect that person to be at risk of significant harm, although we do appreciate and acknowledge that that person might be still continuing to be affected by domestic abuse. So that could be that person has left the relationship, that person is still getting phone calls, texts, the person's turning up at the house but we don't expect any serious harm. When we look at standard, it, we're probably looking at those clients who may just need that little bit of advice. So they want to, some advice around child contact. They want um, some information about getting a civil order in place. Those are the standard and medium. And we can still support, as I mentioned, via our duty line. So our service works with all high risk victims and survivors of domestic abuse who request our help. 
This does include male victims, those in same-sex relationships, as I've mentioned, and those with no recourse to public funding, which means, in a nutshell, that they can't access public funds, perhaps because of the visa status. So if people can't access things like emergency accommodation, because um, the, the problem with emergency housing is, if people aren't accessing public funds, then they don't really have a right to access housing. So what we would do in that situation is we would tap into our own budget and work on things like providing hotels until we can work with um, solicitors and legal representatives to try and get that person's legal status looked at. So referrals may come from any agency, organisation and clients can also self-refer to our service if they wish using our duty number. So just a bit of a workflow there on how our referrals operate. So referrals come in to us. Um, the dash risk assessment is looked at. So it either comes in as high risk, which means significant harm or death. That person will be allocated an IDFA, standard and medium. Um, you've got there the National Domestic Abuse Helpline, which is a really useful tool for those not quite hitting out criteria but needing support. And as I mentioned, they can still use our duty line Monday to Friday. Now, if a person does hit Marrick, their referral will be uploaded and then they will be heard at the Marrick meeting that I've just discussed on a fortnightly basis and that will be fed back to the client. Um, one last thing before I do go on to our information, our contact information, the one chance rule. I always mention this because it's something that's really pushed by the Manchester Safeguarding Board. You may only have one chance to save a person's life. So if a disclosure is made, always take it at face value. Always take that person seriously and take on board everything that they're telling you. Because especially if somebody's living through something like on a base violence where there might be multiple perpetrators, they might have very limited chance to be on their own at any given point in the day. You might be the only person that they've had the chance to disclose this to. So it's really important to recognise, take on board what they're saying and act accordingly. Even if that's picking up the phone and having a conversation with us as IDVAs, just please, please make that phone call. Um, that person may never get the chance to disclose again for, for quite a considerable length of time. So if a disclosure is made, just be aware of our contact details just in case you need that extra support. So in summary, and to finalise, the contact details for our IDVA service. So that's the number, our main duty line, which is 0161 And the email you see there is our central email, which is looked at daily by our lovely engagement team. So if you need to get in contact via either means, then somebody will always get back to you. And I think that sums up the presentation for today. So thank you very much. And I appreciate everyone's time. And if anyone has any questions at all, please do not hesitate to give us a ring or drop us an email. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Kate. Thank you.